surprise of you people to join together to remember a person whom I very fondly recollect and I miss deeply. Sir, for for me personally, uh, he, you know, he, he was always held in awe. So, uh, uh, you know, like a typical uh, fresh uh, fresh graduate, uh, was very hesitant even to open my mouth in front of him. You see, it is I owe this to Rakesh. My memory, uh, I used to address him. My memory goes back to having visited the Patna High Court and Rakesh inviting me to the library and telling me about the solicitor's club, which was an exclusive preserve of which he was the president. So I was at the library and I was introduced to Bauji there, who welcomed me with a cup of tea and regaled me with some anecdotes about the club. So that was the first meeting that I recollect. Then post that, there were a few matters where Rakesh was kind enough to engage me. And Bauji was also involved in those matters. And that is how our friendship, you know, over a period of time grew. And I got to know him more intimately. As a person of great education, as a person who was very generous, and as an older man in the profession, these kind of people are very rare to find. And should be cherished. Even today, as I talk to you on my table, there are a group of books which he presented to me. The Hamlin Law Lecture. I was introduced to that by Bauji. Hmm. English common law and its relevance as far as the development of law in this country, the importance of that, and to understand basic nuances. In addition to that, I learned from him. So I used to always look upon these interactions which I used to have in relation to the said matter, where you know he would come and he would, apart from sharing many other things, we also used to share a smoke. <laughs> so he was fond of smoking. So I, I am a smoking partner also, as far as uh, certain things go in Delhi. So I really, and it was unfortunate that when he expired, I was unable to come and uh, you know be there in Patna. To offer my condolences, but a great man will always be remain and be cherished in my memories. Anyway, you are doing a great job by starting a memorial lecture on his behalf, and I would love to participate and listen. Thank you very much for inviting me. Dr. Mori has done a commendable job in in keeping our minds open, even when uh, we were supposed to keep our doors shut to follow the administrative guidelines in the wake of this corona pandemic. I remember the day corona was, uh, this this lockdown was proclaimed. Dr. Maure talked to me and he stressed the need of a virtual courts argument through video conferencing and meeting through in conferencing, etc. But the difficulty was that uh, lawyers were not very friendly with this new technology that was uh, required to make it possible. So he decided to come forward and he decided to train us. And that is how he sent us the link when we could join. I, Dr. Ra uh, Rakesh Kumar Samrindarji, Amit Prakash, host of other. And if we have to count the numbers, it goes uh, more than 100. In, in these days who have been made familiar with or acquainted with these techniques which we re require to adopt uh, while doing this video conferencing. Uh, in the process, uh, we had uh, certain presentations, presentations on how to, how to make our uh, residential chambers uh, online, what, we, what would be the required cyber security precautions? What would be the required internet requirements, etc.? Then we decided to organize an e moot court where some of our uh, friends and senior colleagues uh, put considerable effort. They prepared themselves and argued before two sitting honorable judges of our high court namely Honorable Mr. Justice Anil Kumar Upadhyay and Honorable Mr. Justice Mohit Kumar Sa. 
Now we have decided to hold some special lectures in the memory of leaders of our bar. Those who created milestones, those who fought uh, many legal battles leading from the front. Those who will always be remembered through the cases they argued and got the law settled. We have a lot to learn from him. The standards they set would be very difficult to maintain in the for the future lawyers. And we need to emulate their qualities. We need to we need to learn from them. And the first in the series is uh, 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 Avay Kumar Singh Memorial Lecture, where Dr. Mauray would be delivering a lecture in his memory. Today we are benefited by the presence of two very distinguished uh, persons, one in the field of law and other in the field of administration. Uh, Mr. Hari Haran is a senior advocate. Uh, he has already expressed himself that he had opportunities to work with late Avay Kumar Singh, whom he hold in very high esteem. And the other is uh, Mr. Vineet Vinayak, who is uh, an IPS officer, who is presently joint director CBI. We often boast ourselves, we, we, we feel proud when we say that uh, the joint director CBI, Mr. Vineet Vinayak, uh, is from our own state, and above all, he's the son of a senior advocate of our high court, or is the worthy son of a worthy father. The, the responsibility he is discharging is no mean responsibility. The, the, the jurisdiction of a joint director CBI is throughout the length and breadth of this country. And he is considered to be a very distinguished IPS officer. I, 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 ext I welcome him on my own behalf and on behalf of Atm both and all the guests and participants present here. I welcome Mr. Hari Haran, senior advocate, on behalf of myself and on behalf of all the guests and uh, and the participants here. Now, to begin with, uh, I would uh, I would request uh, Rakesh Kumar Samrinderji to welcome the guests and introduce the topic. Thereafter, Dr. Mori will deliver his lecture. Rakesh Kumar ji. Uh, it is my privilege that I have been invited to give introduction on eve of memorial lecture in fond memory of late Avay Kumar Singh, a senior advocate of Patna High Court, which has been organized by the Atm Bodh. Atm Bodh is a non-profit organization which provides a platform for law students involved in legal aid and human rights activities to continue doing their good work even after joining the legal profession. Atm Bodh is currently focusing on capacity development of young lawyers in India so that the better access to justice can be secured at public at large. It is a brainchild of Dr. Maurya Vijay Chandra, who is a practicing advocate of in Supreme Court of India. Dr. Maurya Vijay Chandra, he did LLB from Campus Law Center, University of Delhi, and thereafter he has done Master in Human Rights from London School of Economics and Doctorate in Law from University of London. He was also <coughs> admitted as solicitors in England and Wales in 2005. Dr. Moria has taught contract and public law to the undergraduates at Queen Mary University of London. He has vast experience in the litigation, mainly in branch of contract, arbitration and public law. Today, the Atm Bodh has organized a memorial lecture in memory of late Avay Kumar Singh, a senior advocate of Patna High Court, on the topic Contra Proferentum, the rule, its origin, application, and relevance. This topic relates to the interpretation and construction of contractual terms and is most relevant in the present commercial world. Now, late Avay Kumar Singh, a senior advocate popularly known as Abhay Babu, was a celebrated lawyer and legendary figure in Patna High Court. He was also the president of the prestigious Barrister Association of Patna High Court. 
He left for heavily abode in the month of September 2019. It is my fortunate fortune that I had an active association with Abhay Babu for about 15 years and had occasion to assist him in several cases. He was man of integrity and practiced on his own terms. He believed in value, ethics, and morality. Abhay Babu was hardworking and hard task master for juniors. He was having knowledge of every branch of law, whether it is criminal, civil, contract, constitution, or service jurisprudence. His practice was not only confined to the Patna High Court, but he also frequently appeared before the Jharkhand High Court, Supreme Court, and Abhay Babu has contributed a lot of contract In one case, related to Bajnath Temple Devgarh, the case was listed before the division bench of Jharkhand High Court. The Chief Justice was not giving indulgence to Abhay Babu. When he tried to address the court, the court loudly asked him to sit down, otherwise the contempt proceeding would be initiated against him. Abhay Babu told that the Chief Justice, your lordships have ample power to issue contempt, but if your lordship have guts, send me to the jail, I am ready to face the contempt. So Abhay Babu was assertive, fearless, but polite. Abhay Babu, in case of Sajal Chakravarti, who was ex-Chief Secretary of Jharkhand relating to fodder scam, gave a new dimension of the concept of issue stoppel, double jeopardy, and doctrine of segregation. In one, Jaswal was convicted in several fodder scam cases and was awarded conjugative sentences of 144 years. Abhay Babu appeared before the Jharkhand High Court and gave a new interpretation of applicability of doctrine of proportionality in sentencing process in India. The five special, judges special bench of Patna High Court appointed Abhay Babu as amicus to assist the court on the topic as to whether a private cooperative society is a state within the meaning of Article 12 of the Constitution of India. This has been reported in 2014 1 PLR 695. In service law is concerned, we know that the basic principle is that the charges leveled against the delinquent public servant in departmental proceeding is proved on the basis of preponderance of probability. So the standard of proof is preponderance of probability. Abhay Babu gave a new dimension that if the charge of fraud is alleged against the delinquent public servant, even in case of departmental proceeding, the fraud must be proved like a criminal charge. That is beyond reasonable doubt and not on the basis of preponderance of probability. And he also referred D. S. Smith on judicial review that public law has recently been involved from culture of authority to culture of justification. So far in contractual matter is concerned, one Webel Technology Limited was allotted the work of providing computer literacy program in Jharkhand. The government, Jharkhand government backlisted the Webel Technology for indefinite period. The order of backlisting was challenged before the Jharkhand High Court. However, Rabi appeared and made a legal proposition that certainty, predictability, and reasonableness are core constitutional value of consideration. And, and that very basis, the order of backlisting was set aside by the High Court. I, I have learned many things from my esteemed senior Abhay Babu. He will always remain a source of inspiration for new generation. Now I will request Dr. Maurya Vijay Chand to deliver lecture on the topic of the day, that is contra proferentum. Good afternoon, everybody. Mr. Uh, Vineet Vinayak, uh, Mr. Oh, yeah. Hari Senior Advocate, Delhi High Court, and uh, all others uh, present here today. Uh, it, it is uh, a privilege for me to uh, speak on this uh, topic today in the memory of uh, uh, late uh, Abhay Kumar Singh, uh, Senior Advocate, Patna High Court. Sir was a very, very towering personality when we had uh, joined uh, the profession. And uh, in fact, 
uh, as uh, uh, mr hariharan was mentioning the the barristers association itself was uh, uh, a kind of a place so just entering that corridor itself uh, made you uh, uh, more disciplined than you ordinarily were uh, as contrasted to the other flank of the high court which uh, which houses the advocates association then you had uh, a person uh, a, a persons of such uh, you know uh, caliber uh, that when you interacted with them you felt the uh, you know the amount of learning that you need to do uh, to progress in this profession and to uh, reach any height let alone uh, the heights that they had uh, achieved and uh, today i am humbled uh, that uh, i am speaking in his honor and uh, of course i i am uh, i still feel like a, a child uh, speaking sp speaking in front of elders and uh, um, uh, might uh, might not be able to justify the the greatness that he uh, embodied but still i would uh, uh, try to uh, do do justice to the subject that we have chosen and uh, uh, i i would uh, express my gratitude to all uh, colleagues uh, uh, from patna high court who uh, who have uh, been with me who have uh, 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 come along to uh, join this uh, this uh, movement that uh, we are trying to create to get everybody online to start um, uh, uh, arguing online and in a paperless manner and, uh, and the people with such seniority and experience uh, as uh, uh, mr rakesh uh, samrendra and uh, mr vinodanand mishra mr ravindra kumar all others they have uh, uh, joined and are uh, actually uh, spending two hours every day not only learning themselves but also uh, uh, passing on uh, the the knowledge that uh, or the skills that they are picking up uh, to others and encouraging others to come on and assuring them that this is nothing that is going to be uh, you know that's that's uh, very difficult to uh, latch on to uh, and i would also like to mention that uh, uh, mr binodanand mishra uh, uh, had this uh, uh, great idea about um, uh, lacing these uh, uh, ict sessions with substantive law sessions where we could invite uh, speakers uh, to to enlighten all the others uh, once in a week uh, to to uh, uh, learn on the latest developments now uh, uh, coming to uh, the uh, the topic uh, that that i need to uh, speak on today my uh, uh, my ex experience and exposure uh, to this this particular rule um, has been as a student of contract law as a uh, person who's uh, uh, taught contract law uh, in a uh, in an undergrad uh, class and uh, when when uh, reading this uh, rule as a student or as a teacher the significance of this uh, rule uh, did not dawn on me as much as uh, uh, it dawned when i started practicing and when i started practicing by by this i mean uh, uh, my my practice as a solicitor in england and uh, there i was an in house counsel and uh, i was uh, doing a lot of work on structuring international national contracts um, on uh, infrastructure development and uh, uh, and it it's it's very uh, interesting and until then i did not have the uh, uh, businessman's uh, mind uh, so things were like uh, very uh, cut and dry for me so i was surprised when uh, one of my internal clients he said look you uh, look at this contract and uh, you have to word it in a manner that uh, the other side could should not get out of it we should be able to get out of it when we whenever we want i mean I, this kind of a wolf situation was uh, something like uh, very uh, uh, contrary to the basic notions of justice fairness and equality that i had uh, grown up with and uh, but later as i realized that uh, this is this is the uh, the harsh reality of the commercial world that we are in so uh, we all seek advantage for for us and the disadvantage for others and uh, it is in this context that uh, that uh, this rule perhaps uh, originated uh now uh, i will go back to the uh, origin of the rule a little bit later uh, be, but uh, before uh, i i talk about the origins i would uh, like to introduce the meaning of the rule of course all of us are uh, uh, are practicing lawyers uh, so uh, uh, most of us will be uh, aware of it but uh, still uh, 
uh, for the sake of completeness, I will uh, I will uh, uh, sort of uh, draw on uh, some Supreme Court decisions to uh, uh, to explain the rule. Now, the uh, there are various decisions in which this uh, rule has been explained, but I have uh, chosen uh, three of uh, of the decisions uh, which which contain uh, the uh, rules in the most succinct manner and have quoted certain texts, uh, uh, English texts, with uh, approval. Uh, uh, one is uh, Messrs. IP Investment Corporation versus uh, New India Assurance. Now, uh, this is a 200, 2016 judgment, and uh, I have chosen this because uh, it's uh, uh, penned by Honorable Justice uh, uh, Nageshwar Rao. Uh, L. Nageshwar Rao, and um, uh, this is the kind of interpretation that we are likely to see for uh, you know uh, foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, in in this uh, judgment, the uh, the court uh, has uh, quoted uh, uh, McGillivray on insurance law, uh, and uh, it says the contra preferentum rule of construction arises only when there is a wording employed by those drafting the clause which leaves the court unable to decide by ordinary principles of interpretation which of the two meanings is the right one. One must not use the rule to create the ambiguity. One must find ambiguity first. The words should receive their ordinary and natural meaning unless that is displaced by real ambiguity either appearing on the face of the policy or possibly by extrinsic evidence surrounding uh, circumstances. Quite apart from contradictory clauses uh, in uh, policies, ambiguities, and here policies are insurance policy uh, is being talked about, ambiguities are common in them and it is uh, it is often very uncertain when the parties uh, to them mean. In such cases, the rule is that the policy being drafted in language chosen by insurers must be taken most strongly against them. It is constructed contra preferentum against those who offer. It is a doubtful case. Sorry, in a doubtful case, the turn of the scale ought to be given against the speaker because he has not clearly and fully expressed himself. Nothing is easier than for the insurer to express themselves in plain terms. The assured cannot put his own meaning upon a policy, but where it is ambiguous, it is to be construed in the sense in which he might reasonably have understood it. If the insurers wish to escape liability under given circumstances, they must use words admitting of no possible doubt. Now, uh, the the court goes on further and uh, deals with uh, other other uh, uh, texts as well. But the crux is that the the rule applies when there is ambiguity, and that ambiguity cannot be uh, cleared, reconciled, or harmos harmoniously imp uh, interpreted without uh, with the aid of all existing, all other aids of uh, constructions of contract. So this is, in a, in a sense, a rule of last resort. And uh, then the second judgment that uh, uh, that that uh, I I really like is which uh, quotes with approval uh, the Halsbury's uh, Laws of England, and uh, uh, there the explanation is very uh, lucid, and uh, that that judgment is uh, United India Assurance. Company Limited versus Oriental Treasures Private Limited. Uh, the, the court quotes the Halsbury Laws of England and uh, says contra preferentum rule. Where there is ambiguity in the policy, the court will apply the contra preferentum rule. Where a policy is produced by the insurers, it is their business to see that precision and clarity are attained. And if they fail to do so, the ambiguity will be resolved by adopting the construction favorable, favorable to the insured. Similarly, as regards language which emanates from the insured, such as the language used in answer to question in the proposal or a slip, a construction favorable to the insurers will prevail if the insured has created any ambiguity. This rule, however, only becomes operative when the words are truly uh, ambiguous. It is a rule for resolving ambiguity and it cannot be invoked with a view to creating a doubt. Therefore, where the words used are free from ambiguity in the sense that fairly and reasonably construed, they admit of only one meaning, the rule has no application. Now here, as uh, uh, as uh, we may notice, that the the interpretation is against the parties offering 
the particular term. So in this case, the the uh, the authors of Halsbury's Laws of England have uh, um, have balanced that if in a particular in the same contract there is one author of one term and another author of another term then the rule has to be interpreted against uh, uh, against the person who is apparently the author of that particular term so uh, the the rule applies if we were go to go by this definition to the t various terms of the contract separately and not to the contract as a whole now the third judgment that uh, uh, that that i would like to uh, point out today is uh, sushila van indra van uh, in, uh, gandhi versus the new india assurance company now in this is a very recent uh, decision uh, april this year and uh, penned by justice nariman again um, this is a very useful compilation of all the um, uh, all the material and all the definitions uh, and understanding of of this uh, particular uh, rule and uh, if we if we uh, look at it, uh, it it also cites one of the earlier uh, decision uh, of the court in industrial promotion investment corporation of orissa limited versus new india assurance limited and it uh, uh, it it again is in the context of the uh, law of insurance uh, so uh, in in this in this judgment again uh, what the court uh, says is the same thing that this uh, that if a contract has to be interpreted, then the term has to be interpreted against the person who proffers the term. So whoever has uh, spoken about the term, whoever has uh, drafted the terms, and uh, he has to be at a disadvantage when it is to be interpreted. Now, uh, going by this, uh, perhaps, and, and other texts as well, an impression is created that this rule has originated in the law of insurance. Now, uh, is that the case? I recently uh, stumbled upon a, stumbled upon a research uh, which which dispels this notion. I mean, this is the notion which even I carried uh, until uh, very recently that this is this has uh, its origin in the law of insurance. And I was looking at the uh, at containing the effects of this uh, this rule for uh, towards my advantage in particular matters uh, to uh, the law of insurance. And then I realized that no, this is uh, this is not. Uh, um, a rule that originated in the in the law of insurance. Uh, it it actually originated uh, way back in 14th century in uh, the uh, the by the glossators of uh, uh, U.S. Commons. So the uh, uh, the 14th century lawyers, European lawyers, actually um, uh, started uh, um, uh, crystallizing this rule. And this rule actually was a rule of a wider application in all uh, deeds, indentures, wills, um, all kinds of documents. But at that point of time, it's not very clear as to whether this rule was being uh, applied very, uh, very vehemently or very often. Uh, the rule was uh, a, a kind of a, a, con a conglomerate or a congregation or aggregation rather of um, uh, aggregation of certain uh, principles of uh, uh, the law at that time that said uh, that worked as an admonition against those who preferred a term. So again, going back to the same thing, admonition but not limited to one area of contract but but to a wide a wider range of uh, uh, documentations where any term has to be uh, construed strictly against uh, against the person who seems to have offered it now at that point of time it was not very difficult to apply this law because then courts had very strict uh, rules about uh, interpreting or understanding as to which term was being offered by which party. In today's world, this presents a difficulty because uh, this is a, a world of negotiated contract. This is a world of uh, joint drafting. So, uh, uh, you know, it's very difficult to disentangle as to which person, uh, which party to the contract has offered which term. And, and I'll, I'll uh, come to it, uh, uh, come to how this problem presents itself and what are the attempts being made to solve this problem a little, a little bit later. Let me continue with the journey of, of this uh, rule in, uh, through the ages. Now, um, uh, uh, around 16th century, Coke was the first person who revived this 
Latin tag contra preferentum, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the in the uh, jurisprudence, and for him, uh, it was more of the courts uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to give it as a rule of interpretation that the law interprets the words against a person strongly against himself. So by 16th century, we see the rule had crystallized into a rule of law that was being applied by courts consistently. So as I, I, as I was mentioning earlier in the 14th century, uh, the, the, it was more or less a, a congregation of different other principles, uh, an aggregation of uh, different other principles and worked more as an admonition, more as a principle to rely upon, more, more as, uh, uh, you know, nothing like a very, very strict and solid rule. Uh, by 16th century, this had changed. But the question as to how do you identify uh, who is offering which term in a contract, in a bilateral contract, uh, uh, can be identified. And uh, this lurks uh, even till date. Now, uh, as we, as we uh, progress ahead, uh, by the time uh, Bacon comes uh, uh, to the scene of uh, uh, English jurisprudence, we, uh, we see that he interprets it less as a rule of construction and more as a rule of policy or as a rule of tiebreaker. So uh, uh, if you recollect the definitions that, uh, you know, the, the explanations that I was reading from the uh, judgments earlier. So it says it has to be applied when uh, all other rules of constructions have failed. So what happens if there are two possible interpretations and one has to be chosen and no, nothing uh, in the rules of interpretation of contracts, the construction of contracts is able to help us identify which is the true meaning, then we go to this as a tiebreaker. And in, uh, in many cases, it has been uh, also, uh, you know, exclaimed as an arbitrary tiebreaker that uh, it actually is a, is a matter of policy. You say, OK, what do we do? Uh, we, we just uh, toss the coin. No, we'll, uh, we'll go to the rule of contra preferentum and uh, uh, adopt the meaning that is um, uh, contrary to the term, uh, to, the, uh, to the person who has offered the term. So uh, by this time, we, uh, we come to the uh, 17th century. And in 17th century, the, uh, the theory of contracting, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, started changing a little bit. And uh, the will theory started gaining uh, prominence. That uh, uh, the, the uh, usual uh, thing that, uh, that, we, that we have as the contracts are uh, formed when there is consensus ad idem. So it's the will of the parties that prevails. And by the time we, uh, we, uh, we reach this stage, then the, the rule of contra preferentum uh, is, is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, looking to be a misfit in, in this whole uh, uh, scenario. That is the will of the parties have, uh, have to be uh, the ultimate, uh, you know, decision maker, ultimate uh, fact to be considered. Then why have an artificial rule which says that it will be construed against the other? It, it is the will that has to be discussed and the will cannot be discovered by such an arbitrary rule. The will can be discovered by the plain words and other rules of constructions of contract. Now, uh, uh, with, uh, with this, however, uh, the area of insurance law still offered uh, hope for this, this rule because in area of insurance law, it was very uh, easy to identify who was the profferer of, of the terms because it was widely accepted in the industry and in the uh, in normal commercial world that in an insurance contract, you have the underwriters who actually dictate the terms of the contract and therefore it is the insurance company that should uh, carry the burden of, um, uh, of uh, bad drafting or of any confusing uh, drafting. And uh, it was often said, as, as I read out from one of the passages uh, earlier, that uh, it, uh, I mean, it's easiest for the insurance companies to come out with clearer, clearer drafts. And if they don't come up with the clearer drafts, then uh, you, uh, they, they must suffer. Now, uh, but it remained a very small domain where, where this could be uh, applied. And uh, it, it was, uh, you know, kind of uh, at uh, an uneasy relationship with the, with the mainstream uh, theory of contract. And uh, uh, then 
emerged on the scene the movement of uh, protecting the consumer because the standard form contracts started uh, kind of disparaging the the uh, will theory saying that uh, the uh, uh, consensus ad idem in cases of standard form contracts is just a facade it's it's take it or these are or take it or leave it contracts and therefore um, uh, uh, kind of rule of uh, contra preferentum gained a new lease of life so in in this uh, what the what the rule started uh, uh, to become is a kind of uh, um, uh, a rule that could ban balance the uh, the um, uh, relative bargaining strengths of the party and protect the weaker party so kind uh, kind of an uh, equitable balancey uh, started uh, uh, started uh, uh, you know taking place with the with the help of this rule now uh, at this point of time uh, there's there's another thing that happened and that was exclusion clauses uh, had to be interpreted and in most of uh, the interpretations uh, of exclusion clauses what uh, uh, what we observe is uh, that um, the narrow rules of construction for exclusion clauses sit go side by side with the uh, rule of contra preferentum and sometimes it started to get conflated so confused uh, or uh, kind of uh, you know the the boundaries between the two started getting uh, blurred uh, but the distinction is very important and uh, needs to be uh, understood and maintained because the rule of contra preferentum even today as we see in, in the latest judgment, judgment that i uh, cited is that when all rules of construction fail only then the rule of contra preferentum applies whereas in the uh, in in case of uh, rules of constructions narrow rules of constructions of uh, exclusion clauses it is after all a rule of construction which needs to be applied beforehand before we reach the rule of contra preferentum so uh, i mean uh, the these two rules are different coming back to uh, the rule of contra preferentum in 1977 with the uh, with the enactment of the unfair contract terms act in the uk again uh, there was a sudden vacuum where this rule could be applied of course the insurance contracts in the traditional sense uh, could be applied but uh, what about uh, what about other areas the consumers were now protected by statutory law so therefore this this particular rule seems to be of uh, you know sort of uh, going into uh, irrelevance and then in the in in the year uh, 1998 there came the uh, investor compensation scheme versus west bromwich building society judgment where lord hoffman virtually rewrote the uh, the rules of constructions of a contract and he gave uh, various principles uh, five uh, 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 principles on which the uh, contracts uh, should be interpreted and which did not contain the rule of uh, contra preferentum in fact uh, uh, that generation um, actually sometimes uh, uh, you know uh, slights at this rule saying that uh, if you have reached to this rule then uh, then this rule uh, uh, doesn't Uh, is is not needed and uh, um, uh, so the principles of interpretation and construction of contracts are sufficient and uh, um, uh, good to um, uh, uh, to allow uh, any judge any court any person to understand what the contract what the parties meant by what they wrote uh, um, uh, then uh, what is what is the rule of contra uh, preferentum here for today very interestingly if you if you look at the uh, the indian jurisprudence there are uh, there are two or uh, there are three categories in which this uh, uh, this rule has been applied and uh, the first category of course naturally is the uh, your uh, insurance uh, contracts you'll see lot of cases in the insurance contract areas which cites this rule and um, uh, goes on to uh, give an exposition on it apply it or not apply it the second category and uh, this was a little bit surprising to me was employment law now uh, when you look at employment law um, i mean uh, service law as we understand it um, uh, it, it is uh, mostly statutory but the contractual employment law which uh, 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 which uh, revolves around contracts between employees and employers uh, that has uh, uh, that has attracted some uh, applicability of uh, this rule as well and uh, the bank of india versus k mohandas 2009 judgment which interpreted the uh, vrs rules uh, of of the banks um, 
use this uh, this doctrine and ever since this doctrine has been referred to or this rule has been referred to in the subsequent uh, judgments uh, relating to uh, employment contracts and uh, then uh, this this has also been uh, referred to and interpreted in commercial contracts so commercial contracts and i don't mean to say that insurance contracts are different from commercial contracts but yes uh, in uh, from looked at from the perspective of uh, this rule of contra preferentum they do form separate buckets so insurance contract is a specialist area specialist commercial con specialized commercial contract where this rule has uh, thrived and uh, has kind of brushed aside the uh, the in inherent dilemma that it carries about who is the author of the term whereas in in the main commercial contracts when you uh, when you look at the commercial contracts the bilateral commercial contracts this rule has difficulties in in application because for the very reason that they are considered to be bilateral they are considered to be negotiated um, uh, and um, parties uh, when the when the parties negotiate and jointly draft a contract why uh, uh, why have this rule and uh, how to uh, apply this rule now uh, the uh, supreme court so in chandumal jain case it, uh, the the supreme court stated that in a contract of insurance there is a requirement of good faith in the part of the insured and in case of ambiguity it has to be construed against the company as per other authorities insurance policy has to be strictly construed and it has to be read as a whole and nothing should be added or subtracted that apart uh, as has been held in so and so it is the duty of the court to interpret a document as understood between the parties and regard being had to reference Uh, to the stipulations contained in it now uh, so far as uh, from where i read this uh, this supreme court judgment constitution bench judgment it uh, it reiterates the same thing that this is the rule of last resort but what what has happened is quite often as in this case from where i was uh, reading it susila ben case uh, the quotation starts in a contract of insurance now this is, this quotation is starting from a middle of the sentence if we read the full sentence uh, in in uh, in this it's uh, the the prelude to these uh, this is uh, that contract of insurance are different from contract of uh, uh, from other commercial contracts otherwise they are same but different in one sense that the rule of con uh, contra preferentum applies to insurance contract so in my submission the uh, the supreme court what has uh, what did in that case was to lay down limit the application of the rule specifically to a particular area and saying that in ordinary commercial contract this uh, rule of contra contra preferentum would not apply and it is only in the insurance contract that that rule will uh, will apply now uh, this is i would submit far ahead of time it it was in in uh, 1998 that uh, the ics judgment uh, was delivered in the uk but uh, but our jurisprudence in the indian supreme court had way back in 1966 formulated this position that contra preferentum is applicable to insurance contract and not to other uh, uh, other commercial contracts now Uh, having uh, having said that, have, having taken you uh, through the uh, through the various uh, kinds of contracts in which the, uh, the uh, rule of contra preferentum applies, I would uh, again try to restate or uh, the the um, uh, circumstances in which this is applied. I have, in in the uh, course of the last twenty uh, minutes, I have uh, repeated it uh, quite often, but. It, still i would again repeat it that it is the rule of last resort so whenever faced with this situation my first question is is this a last resort situation where the uh, uh, where the words of the contract the the commercial context of the co contract the commercial purpose of the contract the uh, uh, the background material that can be relied upon extrinsic aids that can be relied upon to construe a contract have they all failed and if they have all failed only then this rule applies i would tend to agree uh, 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 with the, with the, those authors who say that once you have reached this stage then 
possibly the term is void for uncertainty the term is uncertain uh, but nevertheless uh, the the um, uh, rule the uh, pronouncements of the supreme court uh, are to the effect that in those situation as a matter of policy as uh, uh, as an almost arbitrary tiebreaker you can use this rule and say that um, uh, rule of contra preferentum applies and it will be uh, it will be applied against the person who has offered the term now this against the person who offered the term is going to be of uh, of critical importance in modern commercial context and this brings me to the relevance of of uh, this this particular rule uh, in in this uh, age and era what is the uh, what is the relevance of uh, this rule now uh, in construction i'll take the example of uh, construction contract because that is something that uh, um, i uh, handle quite often and uh, in construction contracts uh, what happens is uh, that there is a plea that look the government has uh, uh, floated this rfp the contract terms are already there and based on those contract terms uh, which is take it or leave it uh, term we have entered into this uh, contract we have bid and therefore the rules uh, the terms of this contract should be interpreted against the government uh, no problem on the face of it this is very attractive and uh, this is creating trouble for uh, uh, for a lot of uh, government uh, enterprises and uh, but we need to scratch the surface how is a, uh, a government contract uh, interpreted or entered into rather how 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 does it uh, get um, you know formulated look at any infrastructure contract for example highway development contract now if you recall when we were uh, students there were there was um, uh, you know a lot of halla about world bank conditionalities and all that we have almost forgotten that so for infrastructure development a country like india doesn't have uh, its own capital it needs to borrow capital to develop infrastructure so that it can uh, uh, achieve economic growth and then repay the capital to uh, foreign lenders now when the uh, capital comes it comes with conditionalities uh, you have to have this kind of contracting framework you have to have uh, uh, x core in uh, uh, you know ease of doing business and all that you have to have rule of law then gradually comes in that okay these are the models of contracting why don't you adopt them then so actually if a public private partnership contract is entered into it's not a contract that the government has negotiated or the government has stipulated as an arbitrary and dominant party in the contract actually the government first adopts and there it's the weaker party the framework that is uh, proposed by its lenders then that goes through a process of negotiation i'm sure uh, uh, many of you must have participated in those uh, seminars uh, organized by trade bodies like fikis asocham cii's where um, various uh, uh, various lectures are uh, given to government departments and uh, uh, and uh, uh, key influences key decision makers are uh, uh, invited and they are uh, influenced about one way or the other the contract should look like or the framework should look like then you have uh, an extensive consultation processes where the industry gives its uh, its inputs to bodies like niti ayog to bodies like uh, the ministry and uh, and then after that a, uh, a draft uh, a contract draft concession agreement or a draft uh, uh, epc contract is is prepared and based on that draft you have an rfp so if you scratch beneath the surface no government contract is actually a contract where the government is a dominant party it has actually negotiated the contract with the private sector even before the rfp was issued because it wants the private sector to come in and participate and invest and invest in it or to carry out its projects and therefore the rule of contra preferentum uh, ought to have a limited applicability in these kind of contracts now 
come back to the uh, other important uh, uh, area of law that we uh, that we stated the employment contracts of course the banks framed the employment regulations but was there not a collective bargaining would not have the uh, bankers uh, employees association officers association be a part of that uh, uh, that drafting process why should uh, the bank be saddled with this responsibility how could you identify that it was the bank who had who had authored the contract yes in a technical sense in a uh, in a um, uh, de jure sense of course yes the regulations were adopted by the board of uh, uh, of a particular bank and therefore it can said to have been authored by that particular bank but was it in reality now why do i uh, um, uh, fret so much about it there is another commercial context to it this there are a lot of arbitrations that are going on and as all of us are aware in arbitrations the role of arbitrator or arbitration tribunals is very very important and pivotal almost the final word the scope of interference of courts in the arbitral award is minimal by statute it is is the policy of minimal interference now what happens the second leg of this particular uh, uh, rule also is that arbitrators if they even if they have interpreted the contract wrongly as long as it is a plausible interpretation one out of one of the two interpretations the uh, this will not be uh, the the courts will not upset the award now if the courts will not upset the award then working backwards what happens maybe a rule of contra preferentum applied incorrectly in a commercial in an interpretation of a commercial contract Uh, even if it is uh, it is applied in uh, there nine out of ten times the uh, they are going to escape scrutiny and therefore the arbitrators are going to have the last word on this one and in in uh, very recent uh, um, uh, pronouncements of the supreme court i have seen that uh, that this is what is happening and um i would this i would reserve this for some other day but what is happening is that uh, that awards which are palpably incorrect are passing through passing the muster just because uh, the interference the scope of interference is uh, is very limited by the courts and uh, therefore the arbitrators are now using or rather i would say misusing this rule to uh, to interpret contracts in particular manners uh, that uh, that are uh, that are uh, lean in in favor of one party or the other of course in individual contracts they are being challenged and uh, there are individual remedies to it but as a collective we we need to think as to what is the role and relevance of uh, this doctrine which originated in the 14th century and which is not a doctrine that has remained consistent through the ages the tag might be the same but its content has changed through the ages from 14th century till today so uh, from uh, a, a a rule uh, against uh, a rule of admonition against people who offered particular terms uh, to uh, a rule to uh, protect the weaker party it has it has uh, changed its it's morphed itself over the ages uh, why uh, why should we be relying on it uh, extensively in in commercial contracts Uh, uh of course uh, this will uh, this will uh, you know uh, be debated and discussed in the times to come because um, uh, due to this covid scenario a lot of contractors uh, or lot of people who have entered into contracts will either try to wriggle out of on risk contracts or minimize their liabilities or maximize the comp compensation or damages that they are seeking and in in their desperation to uh, to seek uh, to maximize their uh, their benefits they will rely on twisting and distorting the terms of uh, terms of the contract and this rule will come into play and it's it is going to be very helpful for us to have this uh, this uh, this whole thing in perspective when we are dealing with the, with the such matters and uh, and i would say that despite all the uh, you know recent pronouncements the pronouncement uh, of 1966 supreme court uh, constitutional bench judgment that is the uh, uh, that is the pronouncement that should be um, adopted 
and that should be uh, taken as a guiding light. Of course, it is a binding pre precedent, but you know, uh, with the varied applicability, um, uh, it, it uh, kind of dilutes. And therefore, I would like uh, I would like to emphasize that this is what we need to fall back on. Uh, I think I've exceeded my time limit. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me a patient hearing. Uh, it's it's been uh, a pleasure talking on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. This, uh, this, 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 the kind of lecture you delivered could not have been possible without burning the midnight night. I think, uh, Dr. Moore, uh, before uh, we come to the vote of thanks, uh, especially thanks by us, and uh, it is not very easy to be with find ourselves with a person like Vineet Vinaya. I think uh, I may request him to specially thank Dr. Moore, bless him so that he can uh, he can do something more for us in the future. And we will by him that time. May I request Vineet Vinaya to say a few words on the occasion. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, let me begin by expressing my heartfelt gratitude to all those who have made this event possible. Especially Rakesh Samarendra Bhaiya, Vinodanand Mishra ji, both advocates of Patna High Court, and the esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Maurya Vijay Chandra, advocate Supreme Court of India. Also, many thanks to Hariharan Vaya for being present here. Speaking about my father, let me admit that as all kids of our time, we grew up in a very strict and a discipline-oriented environment. With the, all the indulgent communication, being limited to that being with the mother. But I always felt that my dad was proud of our achievement and that I have learned a lot from him by just watching his conduct and his maintenance and his reliance of harm on high standards of integrity and personal conduct. Though I never found myself adequately equipped to discuss with him the nuances of law, I tried to make it up with my anecdotal experiences as a police officer. I thus a number of times ended up discussing with him the criminal law. On this issue, whenever I argued with him about what in my opinion, I say within courts, unnecessary need and requirement of the high level of standard of proof for establishing a prosecution's case, he always used to say, remember it's a lonely individual fighting the might of the state. Lately, we were also discussing the various judicial pronouncements which had turned the principles of criminal jurisprudence, which in, he, in his view was up, upside down. Now, the first one being that the jail and not the bail becoming a rule and guilty 
till not proven innocent becoming another accepted norm the principles of proportionality in sentencing was another favorite topic of his wherein he ended up criticizing a lot of judgments especially going against my own organization cbi when similarly placed accused was either sentenced differently or the same or in different conspiracies if a person had a similar role he being sentenced to different periods which he attributed to a number of issues one major thing being the weakness in the bar i don't know how far he was correct on this issue i leave this as a food for thought for all the people who are mem- esteemed members of the bar and have an onerous responsibilities upon them friends i must candidly admit that these thoughts and deliberations which we used to have definitely have had a significant bearing and imprint on my conduct and performance and in my appreciation of the evidence and issues as a police officer or an investigator in a leadership role i am very very thankful to all of you for this wonderful effort and i am sure that there would have been a lot of takeaways and value addition to our own domain knowledge on the issue from whatever has been eloquently spoken by dr morya thank you very much and namaskar thank you sir now thank you I sir thank you request sir request amit amit prakash to go to a vote of propose a vote of thanks and there are thank thank my first of all i thank atmbodh especially the speaker mr madhav jaychandra who has not only given us a very enlightening and illuminating views about the topic but it was also very didactic and a quite of learning from it and his efforts was consistent with the effort the late mr abhay singh as we know him as we knew him and that he used to work overtime on a brief and he was doing all justice for the client so morya's effort was in consistent with the great personality of dr abhay singh i my thanks to him and my thanks to all the colleagues and others who have joined in this lecture especially the two chief guests one mr hari harang about him about whom i have only heard i have never met him but it is said that he is a authority on criminal law i take this occasion to tax him and also to invite him in one of the platforms of atmbodh to enlighten us on any of the topic of criminal law which he would choose my special invitation and a special request to him apart from that uh, about great abhasing uh, late abhasing the i associate myself fully with the sentiments expressed by my uh, elder brother rakesh samrendra who was very much associated with him and uh, i only recall one anecdote with his son mr vinith vinayak with whom i met with a very common friend mr ajay narayan so i met him i we discussed about abhasing so i said that all said and done is beyond our reach i was a very junior lawyer at that time he said ki why you are saying like this samule ki he is very costly and it is very hard for a junior to approach him then he took help but not took it as, as an offense but as a friend we were discussing but like no no amit you don't know him then you don't know him fully he also does pro bono cases 
So I said, does he do that? But he doesn't have a reputation because whenever I have heard of him, nobody says you cannot reach Abhay Singh because he works a lot, but he charges also a lot. But later on, when I grew uh, older in Bad, there were certain topics that were very dear to him or certain issues which were very dear to him and he used to devote time. So in his great memory, we have learned a lot. And my I conclude this by saying, that I was enlightened by his son, that not only he does work for a, for a pay master, but does it for a good cause also. Thanks. Thanks a lot.